I, I love these stories as well as many others. You'll find them if you're wanting to look ahead in 1 Kings starting at chapter 17 and they continue on into 2 Kings. Now you may wonder, why come to church and listen to stories of ancient dead people? Good question. Well, I believe that these stories are important for us today. They still speak to us today. God speaks to us through these stories. I think it's important that you kids know these stories. They are stories of ordinary people like you and me. James tells us that Elijah was a man just like us. Now you know some of the stories probably already and you think Elijah was a man just like us and he did all that. Well, that is what it says. Elijah was a man just like us. And we'll see that Elijah was bold. And Elijah was courageous. But we'll also see that Elijah was fearful. And Elijah was discouraged. That sounds a little bit like us too, doesn't it? When we hear and read these stories, they give us a picture of how people live their lives for God. How they walked with God and how they followed God's ways. They show us how God worked out his plans and purposes through ordinary people like us. And it's not always the way that we think that it should be. And we'll see people who live through very difficult times, people who fear for their lives. They don't know what's going to happen next. And we'll see the choices they make to be faithful to God in the midst of whatever they face. These stories give us courage to follow Jesus as he leads us, and, as he, and, and they encourage us to stay strong in faith. So I want to start with a little bit of background. I think this is important. I, I hope it's not boring, but it just gives us a, a, a center of where this story begins. First and second kings tell us about the kings of Israel. So the first three kings of Israel were David, then his son Solomon, and Solomon's son Rehoboam. And during Rehoboam's time, there was conflict, and the kingdom divides into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And the kings that come during that time when the kingdom splits in Israel are Jeroboam, Nadab, Basha, Elah, Zimri, and Omri. And we're told that all of them, every one of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord. All of them led Israel away from the Lord their God. And Ahab is the son of Omri. And Ahab became the king of Israel. And it says that he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. And Jeroboam, the very first one, was a very wicked and a very evil king. He says he did more. He married a foreign wife and he led, her, led the people into the worship of her god. Her god's name was Baal. And he built an altar and he built a temple for Baal even although God had warned his people against worshiping other gods. Baal was the god of the nations around them. It was a god that they thought was the god of rain, the god of fertility, and the god of wealth. And when God didn't do and didn't act as the people thought that he should, then they would turn to these other gods and pray to these other gods instead for what they wanted. And in 1 Kings 16.33, it says, Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. And that's pretty bad. Now, when you get into the story of Elijah, it seems like Elijah jumps into the story out of nowhere. All of a sudden, he appears before King Ahab. Well, it's obvious that King Ahab already knew who Elijah was. He knew Elijah was a prophet. And, that, and we know that Elijah probably spoke to the king before this time. But Elijah comes and he has a message for the king from God. And he says, As the Lord your God, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And then he turns and walks away before the king or anyone can stop him. And God tells Elijah where to go and Elijah free, flees for his life to the brook that God shows him and God commands the ravens to feed Elijah now imagine being fed by birds they don't feed Elijah worms it says they feed him bread and meat every day 
in the morning and in the evening. Is that something that birds normally do? No, it isn't. Can you think of other Bible animals that did things that were unusual? Donkey talked, right. Anyone else? What are things that animals did in the Bible that were different than expected? I thought of Jonah and the whale. He spit Jonah out on dry land, which seems to me pretty miraculous. Do you remember the story where Jesus tells Peter to go and fish, and when Peter catches a fish, the coin that he needs to pay his taxes are in, is in the fish's mouth? If those are found, some that I thought of. I thought maybe you would even think of some that, that, that are uh, some more of those. Those are just a few. But there's a few things I'd like you to notice in the story. We can often think when we read through the stories that life was easy. People in the Bible had it easy because God always provided everything that they need, everything they want, when they wanted it, when they needed it. That's not true. Think of Joseph and his years in jail. Think of David. Read Hebrews 11 and you read of all the people who died for their faith. God is with us, and believe me, I believe that God provides for us. But it's not always in the way we expect. And it's not always in the time frame that we desire it to be in. And God sends Elijah to a brook. So wouldn't you think that if God sends him to a brook, there should be water in the brook? And the water should stay in the brook no matter what? But it doesn't. The water dries up. There's no more water. Is God not able to provide for Elijah? Well, yes, he can, but God has other plans. And that is the thing that rings in my mind over and over and over again when I think things should be going a certain way. God's plans are so much greater than ours. Talks in the Psalms about God's, either Psalms or Isaiah, it's one or the other, that his ways are as far as the east is from the west. His thoughts are beyond us. So that's why we're called to trust, even in the midst of of not understanding. Yes, God can, uh, God can be trusted, but God has other plans, and God does it his way. And God has a d divine appointment for Elijah with someone who's in great need. This person isn't in, uh, isn't in Israel, but she's a widow in a foreign country. And this widow is not in a position to help Elijah. She suffered grief. She's lost her husband. She struggles to provide for her son. And now with the drought, she's got nothing left. And hope is gone. And she's making her last meal with the little food that she has left in the house. And then she and her son will die. That is her reality. That is what she is looking at that particular day. But Elijah comes along. And I sometimes wonder if Elijah feels like he's jumping from one hopeless situation into another. I wonder if he thought that God could have done a better job, provide someone who could truly help. Imagine how Elijah could have dramatically impacted the whole city or the whole country of Sidon if he had went to the palace and to the king. And God could have provided food for the whole kingdom. God would have been glorified in front of many, many people. But God led him to a widow who doesn't have enough to feed herself. And Elijah goes, and he obeys God. He trusts God's way, and he asks the woman, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I can have a drink? Oh, and while you're going to get it, please bring me a piece of bread too. Now, this woman has already lost all hope. She doesn't seem to be concerned that a foreigner, a stranger, a man, is speaking to her. She doesn't seem concerned about her safety. She doesn't call on her gods to help. She names her reality. And she names Israel's God and Elijah's God as she responds. And she says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour and a little oil. I'm gathering sticks to make a meal for my son. And I and my son will then die. That's what's going to happen. And Elijah's response can sound almost cruel because he answers with an even greater request. He says, don't be afraid. 
Go home and make your bread, but give it to me first. And then make some for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord God sends rain on the earth again. It's a pretty strong words and pretty confident words. I had to think, how would I respond in that situation? How would we respond? It seems impossible. But she does. She takes Elijah at his word. Could be because she doesn't, it doesn't really matter anymore. It doesn't matter if Elijah eats the bread that she was going to have and she dies, or if she eats the bread and she dies afterwards. Or maybe, just maybe she has a ray of hope. And she does as Elijah asks. And a miracle happens. And the flour isn't used up. And the oil continues to pour from the jar. And they have enough food. And it's amazing. God kept his word through Elijah. And they live. And they keep eating day by day as God provides. But that's not the end of the testing yet. Her son gets sick. He gets sicker and sicker, and he dies anyway. And again, you can wonder why, if we were living in that situation, why? Where is God? Why would God allow this to happen? Where is Elijah as the boy gets sicker? Why didn't Elijah heal the boy before he died? Why did the boy die? And we're not told any of those things. But the widow turns to Elijah. And again, she references his God, and she accuses him in her grief. Man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? It's interesting, Elijah doesn't try to answer her question. Elijah doesn't try to answer her question, but he takes the son and he turns to God and he cries out to God, why? Oh Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy to this widow who opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And again, it's a brutally honest question. When I read verses like that, I think, boy oh boy, what do they tell us about how we can bring our concerns before God? Why? There's nothing wrong with saying, why God? And God hears Elijah's cry. And God doesn't answer Elijah's question. But as Elijah cries out, O oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. O oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. O oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. And the breath of life enters his lungs and he lives again. And Elijah returns the son to his mom, and she is also changed. And she says, now I know for sure that you are a man of God, and that the Lord truly speaks through you. And God is glorified. And Elijah is affirmed as a man of God. The son lives. The widow recognizes the acts of a living God who brings life instead of death. And Elijah and the widow and her son they still live, depending on God, day by day, to keep that flour and that oil, those, the flour and the oil jars full, so that they can be saved. Elijah is still hiding for his life, and yet God has powerfully demonstrated that he can spare their lives, and he can provide for them and bring them joy and hope in place of sorrow and despair. Next week's challenge is an even greater one. But I believe that even through that, Elijah continues to grow. We can sometimes think these great men of God are, are these great men of God, great women of God, but they also grow as they grow in faith and as they learn to trust in God and God's strange ways more and more. And they are ready to come and face what's next. And Elijah is a man just like us. He's committed to going where God leads him, even if it doesn't make sense. And that's the kind of people that God uses. The kind of people God chooses to do his work. Those with willing hearts. Those who are committed to him. Those who will go as he leads them. So whether you're young or older, whether you're highly educated or pretty normal, 
whether you are articulate or whether you struggle for words. Even the smallest person can make a difference. We may sometimes be like Elijah. We can trust God as he leads the way. Sometimes we're like the widow. We're faithfully doing what we can with the little bet that we have. But God works. God leads the way. And God is sovereign. He's not going to be surprised by what happens. We might, but he won't be. Let's pray together. Thank you, O oh God, for your presence with us. Thank you, Father, that each one of us, walk as we walk in your ways, that you lead us into situations that we may find difficult, uh, we may not know what's going to happen, but we know that you are there with us and that you will lead the way. And Lord, I pray again that you will continue to surprise us with the way you work things out. Father, you know the, the burdens that we carry for people that we love. And we desire prayer to be answered. People who are sick, people who are suffering and struggling. And yet sometimes it can seem like nothing happens. Father, I pray we may continue to trust you. That we may continue to walk with you. And that you will surprise us with what you can do and what you will do that is so much greater than we could have planned or that we could have imagined. God, you are so good. And we declare that you are sovereign, that the Lord, he is God. Help us not to turn away to these idols that it seems like we can get a faster answer in a different way. Just thank you for each one here this morning. Lord, I pray your hand of, of blessing, your hand of healing, your hand of hope, joy, of peace, of courage upon us as we go out about our days, as we go about our weeks. Father, I know you go with us, and I just pray for opportunities to share this good news with others around us, in our words and our actions. And I pray that as we have been blessed, that we may be a blessing to others in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>